Well, good. I think we'll start. Uh, good morning and welcome. This is Arif Qureshi. I'm one of the managing principals at ICS. Um, as some of you know, we've been working on uh, kind of putting together playbooks and approaches in terms of how we ensure that we open schools safely. Uh, today's session is going to revolve around the educational hybrid model. And one of the things we've done is really pulled together three school districts uh, with different sizes in terms of uh, number of students, number of buildings, uh, so that they can actually take you through exactly their planning process and how they plan to implement the strategies around reopening schools. Um, so with that, let's uh, jump right into the agenda there. Um, there's a few things that are going on. I, I don't know if you guys, had, you know, today there was a tweet I know from MREA and some other organizations in terms of some announcements that uh, Governor Waltz will be making around school reopening and mask use and so forth. So I mentioned that only because I think this is a dynamic situation we're all in. Things are gonna to continue to change and evolve. And one of our plans is to make sure that we have a site on our website where we'll be continuously updating the information uh, so you have the most relevant information as we move forward. Um, as you know, we've been developing an overall playbook for school districts. Uh, all that information is loaded up on our website and at the end of the uh, meeting today, we'll let you know how to access that. Um, and then uh, with that, I may uh, just hold off uh, introducing uh, the speakers. We'll let everybody introduce themselves. We do have a large amount of content, so I think it's important to uh, get this going relatively fast. At the end of it, we will have a Q&A session uh, because we have a lot of people joining. I think we had almost 160 people um, that were uh, joining this uh, webinar. Um, if you can please use the chat function to ask your questions, if you can be specific, uh, because we have three case studies, uh, Bemidji, East Central Schools, and Mora Schools. Uh, if you have specific questions of those school districts, please put that in the chat too, so it makes it easier for Aaron, who's coordinating this, to pull this together. I do wanna take one minute to thank everybody that's been involved in this. We've had a lot of experts. Uh, we have people from the University of Minnesota, we had legal experts, we have public health experts, and of course, school districts. Uh, who've really spent a lot of time with us trying to fine tune some of these issues and come up with a strategy that'll work for each different school district. Because I think that's the other thing that's important. And I hope the uh, people in charge at the uh, governor's office understand that uh, you need to be flexible based on individual situation in those areas specifically. So with that, we'll move to the next slide. Uh, as always, uh, you know, I hate getting our legal involved, but you can't help it. Uh, again, a lot of the information we're providing is uh, directional. Uh, you know, if you are going to implement any of the information that's in here, please consult your own uh, group of people, whether it's your physicians, legal counsel, uh, health and safety professionals. Uh, it's important that uh, you take this information but customize it for your needs. So with that, I'll pass it on to Jeff Schiltz. Hi, this is Jeff Schultz. I'm one of the principals at ICS. Uh, I just want to thank our <clears throat> our three districts. Uh, you know, we have a, a the large district, a medium district, and a small district. Uh, Bemidji Schools, Mora Schools, and East Central Schools. Uh, and I want to thank a number of districts. I think we had about 30 districts that that wanted to be pilots. Uh, <clears throat> but I want to thank these districts particularly because they put a lot of time and effort into their own planning process for their own community schools. And on top of that. They agreed to, to, to do this and share their plans with others in hopes to uh, help you out, but also to get feedback. They're hoping to get some feedback from you today. So please, as, as Arif mentioned, use the chat function. What did you like about their plans? What advice do you have to, to strengthen their plans? Uh, please help, help these districts as they're putting themselves out there and sharing information and helping you out. Uh, next slide. Our speakers today, uh, I wanna to welcome Fred Nolan, uh, new consultant with ICS, uh, former MREA director. Uh, There's myself, uh, Andy Almos is a superintendent at East Central Schools. <clears throat> Dan Voce, superintendent at Mora Schools. Brenda Spars, uh, principal at uh, the elementary school in Mora. Tim Lutz with Bemidji Schools, superintendent. Amy Alsgaard, uh, the principal of the Gene Dillon School in Bemidji and then Colleen uh, Car Carnetto, I'm uh, sorry, hope I didn't butcher your name, Colleen. And she's the Director of Administrative Services uh, and really been assisting their team with their planning process. So thank you to our speakers uh, to help us out today. Next. There's, it, as those that have tuned into our webinars in the past, you've seen that we've, we established uh, 
five steps to reopening schools. These are consistent with MREA and the work that Fred was doing, uh, Fred Nolan doing there as well. Uh, and we are in this uh, prepare stage. Uh, and so we'll, we'll talk a little, uh, specifically about that. We plan to have future webinars with these three districts to share their experiences along the way. How's it going? What changes have they made? What challenges have they seen? So stay tuned to continued webinar uh, uh, advice and information coming forward. Next. In our step three, one of the things we laid out is you really need to understand the capacity of your school. Fred's going to talk a little bit about how to, how to do that. Uh, and, and you need to understand how many kids are coming back to school and how many of your staff are coming back to school. And whether that's in a hybrid model or any model, if you're going to be opening school, uh, there's going to be staff that are uncomfortable or have health conditions and same with our students. So we, we do need to get a good handle on uh, our best guesstimates on who's coming back. And then determine in your hybrid model. You may, need, you, you may be able to fit all kids uh, social distancing in your school district if you have excess space. You, uh, or you may be looking at an AB model of splitting the kids in half or an ABC model splitting the kids in thirds. And, and Fred will, and, and some of these districts will give you their exact examples that they're working on uh, today. Next. When you're looking at the number of classrooms, how, how, many, how many do you have per building? Can you change uh, and use places like gymnasiums for classrooms or media centers for classrooms? I think uh, school districts need to do a little bit of homework on this to see what spaces you may be able to use. We're likely not gonna be having gym as we had it in the past or phi ed. So those spaces may be available for, for educational purposes. And your, your facility advisor uh, can assist you in, in space analysis and how many kids can you safely uh, with, with uh, social distancing, you know, in, including your space in your particular classrooms. Next. So dear, wherever it was just an example of the number of spaces that they had. And we looked at, uh, if you look at their elementary school, the green spaces are those classroom spaces that are available and then little purple spaces are other spaces that could be used for students. And if you recall, MD, MDE and MDH had talked about nine students per classroom in the past, back in the spring and for summer school, they've now changed that to 50% capacity of the school. Next. So calculating that capacity, you know, and it, this is a big change for education because we've been moving towards collaborative learning spaces, moving desks together, students working in a collaborative approach. And now we're looking to change those classrooms into rows uh, and, and spreading the children out uh, away from each other in the various rows uh, and maintaining social distance. And when we talk about six feet apart from each other, you need to think about the student itself. So when we're looking at it, we're looking at like seven foot six circles in elementary, maybe eight foot circles. Uh, and I say circles, you'll see that in the upcoming uh, exercises with the district, just to make sure you have the kids spaced out appropriately in your classrooms. Next. And there's some other modifications. And there was a webinar yesterday uh, and all our webinars are recorded. So you can go on our website and look at it. But it was an hour long webinar talking about the physical changes you should be considering for your schools. Uh, whether it's uh, the indoor educational space, food service changes, your occupant flow and traffic management, arrival and dismissal times, you'll hear that from these districts, uh, plumbing systems, uh, discontinuing drinking fountains, yet you know, keeping uh, the water bottle, bottle fillers available, uh, and then uh, your HVAC systems, which is a big challenge for schools, making sure that uh, we're doing everything we can to keep kids and, and staff safe. Next. I'll turn it over to Fred Nolan. Fred. Thanks, Jeff. Um, this is uh, one of the tools to figure out your staffing. Uh, Jeff went through tools to figure out your physical spacing and how your occupancy at six foot capacity uh, can be. Your staffing is another issue. And um, the, the MDH requires you create a process for families and staff to self-identify. 
The trick is what does that self-identify mean? We think it just means going out and asking staff. No, not really. You invite staff to inform you that they are of high risk and wish to be re have a different reassignment. In fact, when the, the commissioner was asked last Thursday about this on the call-in, she directed uh, districts to the Minnesota Department of Industry and Labor Worker Protection as page. And if you haven't looked at that, I'd recommend you do it uh, because you do need to figure out which staff are willing to, are able to come in uh, in a hybrid model and do in-person education and which will be doing distance learning. Next slide, please. Now, when you do that, you may end up with an out of balance staff. You may not have the right licensures. Um, and so Alex Luizzi, the executive director of the Minnesota uh, Pelsby board, uh, laid out the process for how you apply for out of field permissions. Uh, you may have up to six of those for a, for a, for a teacher. Um, but the teacher also has to sign and agree to this. So this means you need to work individually with teachers and your bargaining groups. There's also a way you can apply for a discretionary variance to waive the posting period. These tools are available on this website, um, but you're gonna have to get your staff aligned properly so you have the right licensures for your distance learning and for your in-person learning in the hybrid model. Next slide, please. So now you're trying to put it all together and say, okay, how many days are in my cycle? So this tool, you can see the link there to um, a whole page on it, including a narrated overview of this tool. It's a spreadsheet you can download in Excel or open documents. And you fill in these, these variables, um, including the variable that's in white there, that in the beginning of the year was the number of uh, students was limited to nine. Now you figure out what the average number of students you can have in your classroom. But you do need to go through these. At this point, you may be making guesses at the percent of staff that are willing to come in, the percent of students that are willing to come in. And, and as you firm these numbers up in your implementation process, this may change some of the outputs. So the cycle goes through outputs. Next slide, please. These outputs um, end up being what would be the, the cycle length given all your data that inputted. And it's gonna come out to an odd number. Well, not an odd number, but a decimal. And so you either round up or round down. And you can see if you kind of squint a little closely, that first column is 2.11 and the other column is a little larger with your additional spaces. But if you round up you, on your current spaces, you end up to three days and you round down, you go down to two day cycle and AB cycle. And whether you round up or round down is really an equity issue. If you round up, you create more opportunities for those who need to come to school more days, such as your primary students, such as maybe students that are two years behind in academic learning, such as students who uh, may not have any internet access at home. So distance learning is very difficult for them, you, but it lowers the total number of days for other students, rounding down just the absolute reverse. And you'll hear the decisions of these three districts as they made decisions on their cycles as to why they did it and what the effects are. And with all that, plus transportation, which was a separate webinar yesterday, I highly recommend you go to it um, on the ICS website. A lot of good expertise, good ideas about how to blend transportation with your facility, with your staffing and your hybrid schedule so that you're ready to go. And now I think we're ready to go to hear Bemidji's story and Tim Lutz. Thank you, Fred. My name is Tim Lewis. I'm the superintendent here in Bemidji, and I'm honored to be a part of this webinar. And I imagine I will probably learn more than anyone else during this morning's session um, as we share what various school districts are doing. Real quickly, uh, Bemidji School District, ISC 31 at a glance, so you understand what we are all about. We have six elementary schools in the district with one pre-K center. One elementary school, that's a four or five uh, age group, and the, the principal of that building, Amy Allgard, is here today and will be highlighting her school this morning. We have one middle school, one high school, and then we have four additional campuses, our community ed building, our transportation facility, a maintenance facility, and a warehouse. And uh, all of these are, are moving parts in a district that serves just under 5,100 students with 966 staff members. So we have a lot going on and a lot of decisions that we need to make as we look at the fall. 
On the next slide, you can see our district planning team as we look at the broad strokes for what we're going to do with reopening this fall. Along with myself, we have the district cabinet and then our entire district leadership team, all of our building administrators and various coordinators. Our transportation is gonna be a huge piece of the puzzle. We have 825 square miles in our district where we drive 74 buses over a total of more than a million miles over the course of the year. So we're working hard to figure out what we're going to be doing with that. And our transportation director was listening in on the webinar on transportation that ICS Build put on. And uh, that's a big piece of what we're going to be doing. Same with our food service coordinator and all the things that we'll be doing there. We'll touch on those a little bit later this morning, but this committee is going to be expanded into a number of other committees once we find out what model we're going to be asked to start the school year with. And then we'll start drilling down into the specifics of our plans. As we switch over to the next slide, one of the things that we really want to focus on here in Bemidji, which is I think every district is working on is equity. And more than any other time in our history, I think equity is a crucial piece of what we provide for our families, and for our students. And we are working very hard with telecommunications companies to provide broadband in every household or at least um, hotspots, if, if that's the least we can do in certain places, to provide nutritious meals to everyone, including deliveries or curbside pickup. More on that later, but we want to make sure that whatever model we're working with, we are providing equitable opportunity for every student and every family. So in order to do that, on the next slide, you'll see that a huge goal of ours is to be strategic and collaborative. And we will continue to modify our plans through collaboration and inclusion of all of our stakeholders to guarantee health and safety and quality and equity for everyone. I've always believed that the smartest person in the room is the whole room and we need to work together by receiving feedback and hearing from our stakeholders we have administered parent surveys, several of them, and staff surveys. And we're going to continue to administer those because the landscape is always shifting with people's thoughts and anxieties and concerns. And Bemidji recently has had its first, a couple of weeks ago, first few cases of community spread. And we now have well over 100 cases in this area in, in Beltrami County. And so attitudes are shifting and concerns and anxiety are heightening. So, at this point, I would like to turn it over to Colleen Cardenuto, our Director of Curriculum and Administrative Services, to talk a little bit about the results of the surveys that we have sent out. So good morning. Um, as we know, communication and transparency is key during these times. Um, at the end of last school year, we surveyed our parents and staff about their opinions and concerns about our distant learning model. Um, we received many positive remarks, which we greatly appreciated. And we also received many suggestions that we're going to find useful if we need to move to this plan this school year. At the end of this June, we also surveyed our stakeholders about their hopes and concerns for reopening schools. And we asked them how likely they were to send their, their child or their student back to school. As you can see by the chart, 62% um, at that time, and that's when we had low cases, uh, was, um, we're almost certain that they would send our, their students back, with 12 being very likely, 13% at a 50-50 rate, 4% uh, not likely, 6% almost no chance at all, and 3% at that time didn't know. Uh, we do believe that that graph will change based upon our numbers, our increase in um, COVID identified cases, uh, but at this point, um, that is the data that we have. We also surveyed our parents about the hybrid rotation model and what their preference would be. And so that's on the next slide. And you will see that um, on that slide, you will see that their preference was an alternative every other day at 32%, but very closely behind it, it was an every other week model. And we brought this back to the committee and after much discussion at this point in time, um, we are strongly considering that we will go every other week. So we'll have an A-week group of students who will, on their off week, also continue to learn through uh, via uh, digital resources and et cetera. And then a B-week of students that will come on the second week and will continue that rotation throughout the year. 
unless we have to switch models. Our next steps in the process, um, once Governor Waltz makes his announcement as to which model we're going to start with, we will then expand our committees again, including our bargain unit representatives, students, parents, um, additional stakeholders within the community. And um, we, will, we are also currently, and actually today, going to be contacting our parents to ask about um, their broadband access, what devices or whether or not they need a device, and how many additional devices they need. And um, as you might be aware, in rural areas, um, one of our bigger struggles is internet access in some, some cases. So we're going to send out a survey and try to figure out how we're going to provide internet access um, to all of our students along with the devices. So those are the things that we're working, working on. Tim. A little bit more now about our hybrid learning model. The reason that we went with the AB weekly schedule, one of the major reasons is because if you consider the fact that weekends can bookend a week, that gives students on the B side when they're doing the distance learning side, it gives students and families nine days to quarantine in between the time that they're in the school building for a week. And we think that'll be helpful, very crucial for health and safety. And one of the other concerns is that we want to make sure, like Colleen said, that we provide students with a one-on-one -on -one for every, every student if we can. We're not sure if we can do that, but we wanna make sure that it, we, they have that equitable access to learning materials, including devices, so that when they are out for the week, they have that in their hands. As you can see from the rest of the bullets there, we know what's required for the hybrid learning model, that we uh, maintain nothing more than 50% capacity with six foot or more social distancing. And we're working on a plan to have students and staff enter buildings at different points in, in the building. On the next slide, a few other points that uh, I'd like to highlight is that you know, we are really working with, especially the busing, how we're going to make sure that whether it's a uh, brick and mortar setting completely or a hybrid that we are careful with our busing. And so we're also surveying parents about how many are willing, able, and capable to drive their, their children themselves to school to help alleviate the issues with transportation. With food service, our on-site meals will be served through specialized prepackaged delivery of every meal to classrooms or sites other than the cafeteria. And that'll be the case for the hybrid or the brick and mortar setting. And self-service options like salad bars will not be available. And we will continue to provide delivery and curbside handout of nutritious meals. In Bemidji, we serve right now during the summer between 2,500 and 3,500 meals a day. And during the shutdown last spring, we served over 10,000 miles or meals a week to families, to students. And of course, we will be providing school-aged childcare for children of critical workers. The next slide, a few other considerations. We've talked about food service, a little bit more about transportation. Our busing service, of course, will be traditional with that 50% capacity. Students will load from back to front, every other seat, and will be required to wear masks. We will run full bus routes every day during the hybrid model because we want to ensure against the potential problem of students mistakenly waiting for buses on days when they shouldn't be on in the buildings. And if they get that schedule mixed up and it's 20 below and dark and parents aren't home, we're still going to pick up those children and then call parents and see about getting them back in the home on the week that they shouldn't be there. Our custodial, we're going to be loading our custodians more in the evening so that they can do deep cleaning of our buildings in between our days because we won't have any days off. And then of course weekends can be more time for deep cleaning of buildings. Something else that we're planning to do is we're working with teachers on call. We have them as a service and we are working on having two full-time substitutes in each of our buildings to guarantee two things. One, that we have subs available because that will be a concern, finding substitute teachers and also we want them dedicated to buildings so that they don't move from building to building like substitute teachers usually do and then act as vectors spreading the disease from building to building. They can stay within the uh, 
homogenous groups that they're already in in buildings. Okay, now I'd like to turn it over to Principal Amy Allgaard of Jean Dillon to get into some more details about her plan and schedule. Good morning, everyone. My name is Amy Allgaard and I'm the principal at Jean Dillon Elementary. Our school is, is a bit unique. We um, serve our fourth and fifth grade kiddos in the Bemidji area. We have approximately 108 licensed and non-licensed staff that work on campus each day and approximately 811 kiddos. We operate 15 sections of fourth grade and 15 sections of fifth. We're on a beautiful set of grounds that covers about 160 acres. Uh, usable classroom square footage that's fairly easy to find is 65,732 square feet. Our building square footage is 124,799 square feet. And ICS has been really helpful, if we could go to the next slide, helping us use a CAD tool to identify kind of our typical spaces are marked in the light blue with red dots, if you will. And then there is some secondary space that we could explore in the event that we wanted to do some different models or had to adapt, as we all have to had to do during COVID-19. Uh, we could expand and or change kind of our plan as we go. So ICS has kind of helped us what we call space mine our school and find potential additional learning spaces. Our current designated classrooms are um, like we talked about our fourth graders are on our first floor and our fifth graders are on our second floor. And what we would hope to do would be to have somewhere in that 12 to 14 uh, kiddo counts in each of our homerooms. Our kiddos would stay put in those rooms. And then our staff, we are kind of unique in the fact that our teachers um, focus in on a couple of subjects, if you will, and they work in pairs and we call them pair shares. And so if you are the math and science teacher, your pair share neighbor is the language arts and social studies teacher. And so what we'll have to talk with, with and about with the staff would be, do they want to stay in the same room and, and teach all four core, if you will, or are they open to the idea of the kiddos staying put and then the teacher simply moves to the neighboring classroom. So those are some things that we'll have to communicate and talk about and learn from our staff on how they would like to do those kinds of things. Um, if we can go to the next slide, it talks a little bit more about the pair share, if you will. Um, organizing our homerooms is gonna be unique and different in the fact that when the kiddos come in in the morning, uh, likely after their temperature is taken, they'll need to go directly to their homeroom. And I think for the better part of the day, that'll probably be their home base. And so, like it was, uh, I believe it was Fred spoke about a little earlier, there will be some need for memorandums of understanding, uh, talking with teachers about options that work for them regarding prep time and student contact minutes and so on and so forth. So um, as it was mentioned, communication is gonna be key, um, keeping teachers in a mindset of feeling supported and um, also having a say and a voice is gonna be critical and important as well. One thing that we looked at uh, here and have bounced it off a few teachers is we'd like to have the teachers pairing in the homerooms with either a specialist teacher or a paraprofessional. Um, as they try to balance the face-to-face -face learning and the distance learning simultaneously, I do feel it's important that they have some support to allow for um, the technical aspect of trying to get that accomplished as well as the classroom management while they are teaching and so on and so forth. It also allows us to have a little bit of a safety net built in in the event that someone does get ill, perhaps they have a dentist appointment because all of those things still are gonna be happening. It gives us a little bit of a, a built-in backup. And so we are really close to having those pair shares set up as well as that uh, team support, if you will, um, within our homeroom classrooms. We'd also like to have our kids have some experiences with their specialist teachers. And so we've developed a way to rotate our specialists through on a two week rotation each quarter and like Colleen spoke about earlier, we'd be in that A, B week, if you will. So the kiddos would have a one week um, exposure to art, let's say. Um, they would have a one week exposure to FIED with their specialist teacher. Um, on the off weeks when the specialist is moving throughout our 15 homerooms, uh, we would ask our typical classroom teacher, if you will, and being elementary teachers, they do have the correct licensure. So we're really fortunate with the building that we have is fairly new, opened up in 2018. Uh, the way that our teams are designed, the way that the building is structured with our classrooms next door to each other, uh, we've got a lot of really great advantages to allow us to be quite flexible and consider several options throughout this hybrid modeling process. Um, but communicating with the teachers and making sure everybody feels supported and comfortable is gonna be key. We want our kiddos to be safe. 
and we want our community to know that we're caring for them and about them as we plan. Just in closing really quickly on my part, I'd like to just thank ICS for their assistance with planning and organizing this webinar as well as a space mining of the maps and the Excel student planning tool. Um, we are hopeful that our teams will, uh, the way that we set up our teams will allow our staff to create safe and sound and supportive strategies to combat the ever-changing landscape that is the COVID-19 pandemic. These plans will also require a lot of communication with our stakeholders. We'll need to communicate clearly with the public, be mindful of contractual concerns and find solutions, etc. This is definitely a team effort for all of us to be successful. Please feel free to contact me. I believe that that information is included in the webinar. If you have any questions or suggestions, because this is very much a starting point. I'm pleased to be part of this com communication, this conversation, but very, very open to feedback. So I want to thank you all very much for your time today. Thank you, Amy. And here's the last slide on the Bemidji presentation. And uh, as you can tell, Amy is really uh, sharp. She's on the ball. She's very detail oriented and she has been anticipating a lot of the issues for the district and for her school building. And I really appreciate the work that she has done in the district and, and for Jean Dillon Elementary School and, and their staff and students and families. I, this slide here talks about the three scenarios. I'm not gonna read them because we all know what they are. But uh, really what I wanna point out is that I've been saying all along that I really see this as two scenarios because really it's the uh, distance learning model and then the in-person model or hybrid, but really they're both kind of the same thing because if we go to brick and mortar, full face-to-face, -face, we are still going to have to allow for those families, those parents who are not comfortable sending their children to school. And so even if it's a full face-to-face -face model that we start with, we will be providing some distance learning to those students and families who are not going to be in our buildings. And if we don't do that, I'm afraid we're gonna lose maybe up to 10% of our children. Something I should also mention it, is that in Bemidji, we have, along with our various buildings, we have four charter schools and three or four parochial private schools. And we have to coordinate with them as well as we look at transportation, as we look at scheduling, we have to partner with them and they are part of the team, even though they're not part of our ISD 31 system. So in summary, we again want to point out and I want to really stress that I'm expecting that we may be running through all three of these models at some point during the course of the year. And that's why we wanna make sure students have access to devices. My hope and my goal is that when we do have to make a switch to, from one model to the next, that we can do so quickly, swiftly, efficiently with no more than a day or two notice. I know that realistically it might take that long. And uh, just that we can make those changes just like we do maybe a snow day and move efficiently from one model to the other. We will be surveying our staff, district staff again, one more time, at least one more time, because uh, from a story on CARE 11 last night, that pointed out that teachers are very, very anxious. Paraprofessionals are, all of our staff members are anxious about what it's going to look like this fall. And like Amy said, we need to collaborate and give them a voice. We need to work together. And uh, like Amy also said, I would like to welcome anybody here who would like to reach me from my contact information and very willing and open to share ideas and to learn and listen together. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Colleen and Amy, appreciate uh, you helping to share your story. Again, folks, please put uh, information and questions, comments, feedback for Bemidji in, in the uh, chat box. Uh, next, we're, I'm going to turn it over to Dan Voce, Superintendent of Mora Public Schools. Dan? Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to share our story of Mora Public Schools. Uh, unique for me, uh, this is my first year as being a superintendent. Uh, I was uh, interviewing in March, officially started uh, July 1st. But uh, I'm very grateful I have Brenda Sparts as a colleague here and a teammate that has really helped shape uh, Mora Mora's plan, so she'll be sharing quite a bit uh, with you. But Mora is in East Central Minnesota. Uh, we have about 1,600 students, about uh, 125 teachers. I'm not sure if that's correct, Brenda. I think it might be more like 250, but I'm not certain. Well, maybe the teachers, but 260 employees. We have a pretty new elementary school um, and is updated 
with a very nice campus and uh, our high school is old. Uh, however, we just uh, passed a referendum before I came on board in May, uh, right in the midst of COVID. Uh, and we have a new field house that's attached to the elementary. So um, we have some, some good spaces and then we have some challenging spaces uh, to, to deal with here in Mora. And uh, I know Brenda's going to talk a little bit about this, but we, before I came, uh, we organized um, our, our teams uh, just to give them a little heads up. And Brenda was on the front line there. Uh, beginning of June, we had a meeting with all of our different uh, union members and key players to just give them a heads up on what we were anticipating uh, and what we uh, will do moving forward to plan and prepare for uh, the unknown. And then we've been communicating uh, quite often with our uh, parents, our school board, uh, community members, and our team. In fact, today after this, we're gonna have a, a town hall meeting with our uh, staff members. Um, and then all the other things that um, go along with that, um, getting ready to hear more about MDE and then getting real uh, down and dirty with our plans and be prepared to implement that. So very grateful again to have Brenda and I'm gonna turn it over to Brenda here. Uh, thank you, Dan. So my name is Brenda Sparks. I am an elementary principal for Mora. I also serve as the um, curriculum person for kindergarten through 12th grade. I, I'm sorry, preschool through 12th grade and special projects, hence my involvement with um, the COVID. So as Dan just um, mentioned at the beginning of this whole thing, we thought, what are the key categories that we're going to need kind of as headers for our process? So organizing and learning, preparing and planning, making sure we communicate, 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 train and staff development, and then that implementation, and then remembering to reflect, review, and we know we're going to have to make adjustments throughout the planning, the implementation and as we move through the year. And so um, those are our main categories of focus. So in organizing ourselves, we put together our committee. We, it's a 32 member committee, it's a large committee, but what we wanted to do is have representation from every single uh, department or group within our district at the table, because we know this is a collaborative process food service, transportation, technology, um, instruction, they're all gonna be interdependent on each other. And so sitting together and making sure we can quickly have conversations when we're planning this is key. Uh, we met on June 4th, we're gonna come back together on August 3rd and 5th after the release of the information and get our plan um, finalize. I'm putting together a, a framework so we'll just have to fill in the blanks with uh, what the committee comes up with and so um, that is um, our organization and framework. So part of that was putting together a really detailed timeline for ourselves um, with our committee meetings, the board meetings, when we were going to put out our staff survey, parent survey, and then key dates for release. Um, you, you'll see on August 11th the communication committee already knows that is the day they are going to start putting out and releasing all of our information. Our website will be ready, um, information will go out to the parents. So that's kind of a key date for our communication and parents can already know and count on that week of August 10th is gonna be when they're gonna know more information. So one of the parts of learning about ourselves, and thank you ICS, this is what they provided us, is what can we do, and this is the elementary footprint for our first level, what can we do as far as putting kids in the classrooms and, and allowing for that social distancing space? So what this mapped out for us in the blue, those are our typical classrooms, the red dots represent a child with their, with their bubble, if you will. And so we know we can fit 12 to 15 kids within our typical classrooms. And we also have the pink areas where we have additional space if we wanna do other things. Or um, in our case, we have a very old high school who have 
there's some really bad um, ventilation in some of the classrooms. Can we use those classrooms? We think maybe we won't be able to. So in our case, we might be bringing some of the high school students over to our elementary, which is newer, and they might be spending time with us over there. Um, so this really provided us a, a look at that and it helped us in our planning. Another thing we needed to know on the hybrid model is can we do AB or do we have to do ABC? We really wanted to do AB because it gets kids in our building more often. So in this, this is kind of a simple look at our data. Our expected enrollment in the blue with the proposed sections, those are the sections we have for K-6. Seven through 12, we reduce the seven periods to six periods. And then in the green, we know some of our families are gonna want that family flex option to continue to distance learn. Um, so about 85% of our kids will probably be involved with coming on site in person for our hybrid model. So can we take that 85% and do an AB model off of it? Well, in the orange, you'll see that, yeah, we can. And this is when, I did this when it was one to 10, but now it might, the 50% capacity is a little bit different wording. So we're good, we're golden with that AB if we stick with those um, sections and the six period day at the high school, we don't have to do ABC. So this was really helpful. I just mentioned the family flex option. So we included this right up front in our planning because we know families are gonna want to distance learn no matter what we do, and that's okay. It might be due to medically vulnerable students or it might be because it's their preference. Either way, that's okay with us. But what we need to do is we need to plan for that. So um, MDE, MDE has already set out that they have to uh, follow the same calendar, have the same curriculum, they're gonna take state assessments. Attendance has to be taken. Um, we, and, and families are gonna have to request this option. And then reliable internet's gonna be really important for these families. So I've already talked to the technology director. As soon as we get these families identified, we're gonna pretty much make sure they have internet and devices so we can, this can be a really positive experience. Um, and we're gonna have a group of dedicated distance learning teachers uh, for this group of families. So we think this is a really important piece of our plan in keeping our enrollment making sure our families know that we're here for them, we're listening to them, we wanna make sure that they're serviced. And so we just upfront called it our family flex option and it's available. So on our AB model uh, for the hybrid model, um, we looked at every other week like Bemidji or two days in school, three days distance learning per, per week. When we did our surveys, which you'll see in a second, in a minute, um, it's a 50-50. Families were 50-50 what they wanted, staff 50-50 what they wanted. So then digging a little deeper, what would be easiest for um, transportation? What would be easiest for meal delivery, materials delivery, um, a few other different things? And then um, providing kids who struggle more uh, FaceTime each week with their teachers. So we thought that the two days on, three days distance learning might be the best way for Mora to go. And so you'll see that Monday, Tuesday, we have the A group coming in person, the B group distance learning. Wednesday, we have both groups distance learning with teachers um, having extra prep because now they're gonna be a distance learn teacher as well as a face-to-face -face teacher. So they're gonna need some extra time. And they're also gonna have to service kids distance learning on that Wednesday. PLCs will happen on Wednesday for 45 minutes, along with if we have any professional development, that'll all happen on Wednesdays. And then Thursday, Friday will be the opposite groups. We know that transportation can't happen like it used to happen. So instead of having one morning route where we pick up all elementary and high school together, we're gonna run the first route with elementary, drop them off, then they're gonna go back pick up the high school kids, drop them off at nine o'clock, and then we're gonna do the same thing in the afternoon. It shortens our day by 60 minutes, but we still have 1,032 instructional hours per year with that model. Um, so we're good as far as um, state statutes are concerned with that. Um, with that, teacher preps are gonna change. Within that six 
hour block when kids are going to be with us, teachers aren't going to be taking their prep during that time. Elementary will take theirs in the afternoon when kids release an hour early. High school will take theirs in the morning when um, the kids aren't there yet before nine. And it's, high school is going to love it because now all high school teachers will have their prep at the same time, which they've, they've wanted for a long time. So that's going to be a positive thing. Also, um, they'll have about 120 minutes in their day because we know they're also going to have to be distance learning teachers on those days. So taking out their regular 55 minute prep, they're still going to have 65 minutes that day to um, have open office hours or have um, a Google Meet with their, their distance learning kids. Um, or some, something like that, because they're still going to have to service those kids on those days. So that'll be a good thing. Um, we also plan to have intervention days for K-3. Um, group A kids will be with their general education classroom teachers on, on their A days. And then if they did not um, make proficiency in the fall on our AFAST reading and or math, we're going to invite them to also come in on the B days, kindergarten through third grade. And they'll be with an intervention teacher getting really intensive support on those days. And we do have those teachers already. It's just kind of repurposing them and making sure that we're filling the gaps. And so at the high school, um, we have our, our six period day now, which is shortened. It was seven periods. And then we're going to divide those between two days. So group A will come on Monday and go through periods one, two, and three. Their lunch is built into period two. Grew, and then Tuesday, they'll go periods four, five, and six with their lunch being built into the minutes of period five. And then the opposite will be true um, for Thursdays, Fridays. So that's kind of a loose schedule for high school. So we did do a staff survey and a parent survey in July. We got a lot of good information from that. A staff survey, are staff comfortable coming back? Um, so 19% comfortable, no concerns. 47% have some concerns. We have 3% there and not comfortable at all. The fortunate thing is on this survey, I know, I know that who they are. I have three primary teachers, three intermed, intermediate teachers, and they are all comfortable with distance learning and they're, and they're good at it. So I, have, I already know that maybe they might be a good fit for being that distance learning cohort, which is great. Um, do they have underlying health conditions? We just, we didn't ask specifically what those health conditions were. We just needed to know like how many staff are we talking about? And then they will, like Fred said earlier, they're gonna have to now self-identify for us. Um, but we have 43 staff that have underlying health conditions that they're not comfortable working um, with kids. Uh, due to that. And then do they prefer A, B, um, two days a week, every other week? 50-50, like I said earlier. And then how many of our staff to do the hybrid model are going to require childcare? So we have 49 children identified in the staff survey that are going to need childcare, which is a lot. But now we're going to need to make sure we put them on opposite days at A, B. So it's not 49, it'll be 25, 25. So that was a key piece of information. Um, moving into the parent survey, we asked about the family flex option. If we do uh, um, in person or hybrid, do you want to take advantage of this? Um, at the time, this was um, a, a day ago, 239 students were identified in our parent survey as wanting to take advantage of that. And it's kind of dispersed uh, between the grades pretty evenly. So about one teacher per grade um, could distance learn for these kids now that we know this. It's about 15%. And then we asked them their preference for um, the AB model, 50-50, add that with the teachers, it's still 50-50, that didn't help us much. Um, and then if, if they usually rode the bus, we wanted to know, would you now be willing to transport? So we had um, 17 or 18% say yes, and we know who they are, so transportation is already going to get their names so they can contact those families to make sure, and then we can mark them off of our transportation plan. Um, we also asked, next slide, 
about um, school issued devices paired with the devices that they have at home, not phones. Do you have enough for all your kids? So we know that. Reliable internet, 9% said they don't have it. So we're gonna work with that 9% to get them that. And then again, we wanted to know the childcare. Um, it was a lot, 130 kids. Um, those parents can document that those, they're essential workers and their kids need childcare on a hybrid model or distance learning model, which is a huge thing to know. So um, that's something that we really need to focus on uh, moving forward. And so what's next for us? Continuing to prepare and plan. Um, we, have, um, we have to divide our kids into the AB groups. We have to contact those families about the transportation, family flex options, childcare, um, connecting with staff on what we learned from the survey. And um, we're going to actually let them know what we learned on our town hall as well. And then what special supplies and orders are, do we need to put together? So we're really working on that list right now and um, including our facilities, our food service, technology, we're having discussions and then continuing to review our, our money sources and how we can best leverage all of our budget items and, and sources of revenue. And so a communication tools that I have put together, you'll see on the uh, left-hand side, I did a one-stop shop gateway, gateway um, document, if you will. So this will be on our website. We'll push this out Facebook, a lot of different places. If you are so inclined, all you need to do is go to this document. It will lead you to our master plan, our quick reference guide, family flex option information and how to request that, learning about our models, and then the links to all the different plans, food service um, facilities. They'll each have their own um, small framework and plan. And so you could click on that and learn more about those. So I like that, it's a one-stop shop. And then the quick guide there in the middle, that will also be pushed out. And if someone wants just a quick glance at what we're doing for scheduling or transportation or learning um, meals, they can just go to that document and get the basic bulleted points. Or if you wanted to, you could go read our master plan, which is several pages long. Um, so those are the three main tools that we will put on our uh, Return to School website, Facebook, um, put out to parents via email or any place else. Um, so, and if you want any of those tools, they won't be up on our website yet. Um, it'll probably be early August. But if you are interested in any of those, please, we're, we want to share. Um, you don't have to reinvent the wheel because we, we made that wheel. So, but I'm so willing to share with you. And then coming up, we have our training and staff development teacher workshop week is gonna be very, very important. Most of that week is gonna focus on uh, teachers working collaboratively together and getting specific training and staff development in place that, will have, that has to do with our models and executing well for our families. And then of course, implementing it and then adjusting as we go. And that is um, the main points of our, of our um, of our plans. And like I said, please, if you have any questions, um, comments, feedback for us, we welcome that. And if you see anything you're interested in knowing more about, just uh, contact me. I'm willing to share whatever we have. Thanks. Thanks, Brenda. And thanks, Dan. Appreciate the, the hard work and all, the, all the, the positive work you've been doing. Again, provide those comments and advice. Any, any positive comments and or challenges you might see on the, on the MORA plan. Uh, Next, we have Andy Almost from East Central Schools. Uh, you know, I just one comment, I thought this was going to be easier for larger districts uh, to, to put these plans together because they have more resources. But what, uh, what I've, what I've uh, learned in talking and working with a number of districts is that I think the smaller districts are e easier to be a little more nimble. And, uh, uh, and, I, and I think uh, you'll see it's a little bit easier I think, at least for, uh, for smaller districts to, to get their arms around this. Uh, and anyway, turn it over to Andy. Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. 
Um, just quick East Central at a glance. Uh, we are a small rural school district located uh, right on the 35 corridor, halfway between Duluth and the Twin Cities. Uh, we're a, a preschool through grade 12 campus. Everybody is housed uh, on one 80-acre uh, campus uh, located just right off the 35 corridor. We have about 810 students with 61 teachers. Um, our school building opened in 2004 with about 240,000 square feet. So again, all on one, one, loca one location and one campus. Go ahead, Aaron. Um, we, uh, uh, like the other school districts, had to build a team. You know, who, who was gonna be responsible for planning this work? And one of the things I think that is really important to know is that we felt that our job as administrators was to break down that 100 page guidance from uh, MDE into smaller incremental steps for our team members. And so we took that approach and we started to meet daily on June 8th. And we went through the guidance, pulled out the pieces that each department had to be responsible for. And again, tried to break it down so it just didn't look so daunting to everybody. But really the nature of our work happened with our administrative team. So between the principals, we had administrative interns, uh, Dean of Students, Buildings and Grounds, Transportation, um, and on and on. But the, the core team was our administrative team. And we would invite in those different departments depending on what we were talking about at any given time. And so that when you see this plan, it really was the, you know, the work of that core team. Um, as we've done this work, we've realized we needed to consult with other people, right? And so we've asked these, these team members to reach out to other schools, to reach out to our neighbors, to reach out to our, to our cooperative programs as well, like our special ed cooperative, uh, and to really talk through what this planning looks like. At the end of the 1920 uh, school year, we did a staff survey. That was really important for us to know the feeling of our staff, um, for, you know, for them to be able to tell us what went really well with distance learning and what did not. Um, so we've taken that information and tried to improve our planning as we prepare for fall. Uh, I think it's really important that we communicate with our union leadership. Um, it, just like everybody else, I'm sure, our collective bargaining agreements are built on the traditional school model. And so we really have to think about those collective bargaining agreements as we change the model to make sure that we're discussing that with our unions. Um, pro probably like most places, open lines of communication there, I think can, can really lead to some effective problem solving. And so we have to make sure that that open communication exists as we plan this. Um, we brought our plan to the school board on July 20th and asked them to approve it. So I gave a presentation about what our model looks like. I think it's really important that the community sees that the, that the school board gives that stamp of approval. Um, you know, they are the people elected to, to, uh, to uh, represent your community. And so if they approve, I think it's a good message to send to your community. What's ahead for us? Uh, we're still planning. So what you're seeing today, I think probably from all the school districts is we've, we've built this framework to build off of. We don't have all the answers just yet and the devil is in the details, but there's a framework that exists and we've posted it on our website so that we can, uh, so that we can build from that and answer these questions as we get closer and closer to school starting. But next week we're gonna hear from the governor and, and we're gonna hear that, uh, you know, what model we're supposed to start school with. At that time, uh, I'm working on three different communications right now to send to families that explains the model, because I think it's important for our families to, you know, to, have it, to have it come directly after that communication from the governor so that they know how this model will affect their family. On the week of August 10th, I've asked the principals to get ready to communicate about student schedules, transportation schedules, staff assignments, uh, distance learning plans, anything like that, that we, we think our families and staff need to know. Uh, we're going we're gonna to have that all prepared to send on August 10th and make sure we communicate these timelines out. On August 31st uh, is our staff workshop. Uh, I put this on there because I think staff workshop has to be really talked about. The traditional staff workshop where we, you know, try to fit in all those legal requirements and some of those things that we have to get done may need to look different. And in, in our district, we're, we are working on that uh, staff workshop schedule to peel out any little chunks of time we can to provide uh, professional development for our teachers, but also just time for them to work. Because if, if they're gonna need to post videos or if they're gonna need to prepare for this, uh, they need time to do that. And so our staff workshop schedule is gonna look much different. 
And of course, the day after Labor Day, school begins and we need to be ready. Just our timeline and communications. Um, you'll see that, that image on the left there of our whiteboard is kind of our, uh, is our plan. Um, the, the black line going down the middle, if you look above it, that's our communication plan and some of our deadlines for when we want this communication to go out to our people. And then below is some of the tasks uh, and, and the deadlines that our administrative team and our leaders need to, need to be prepared to take on. And in the green are the tasks that aren't complete and those things we continue to work through. It's, it, it's, it's uh, kind of satisfying when we can go into that room and, and erase some of those things because they're complete. Um, and so I think it's important as school leaders that we dedicate these things and, and, and show it to people so that they know what those tasks are. Uh, just go back one quick, please, Aaron. Uh, we also created the FAQ document you see on the right. Uh, this is shared between myself and the principals. So as we're getting questions from our community, from our board members, from anybody else that maybe is asking uh, those questions, where the three of us can go and post uh, what the question was and the answers. And I think this is important for transparent communication. It also is serving as a quick reference for our people. You know, when we post a, a huge plan that's many pages long, uh, there is a population of people who are not going to read that in detail. And so we think this FAQ document is sort of a quick reference uh, when they just want to know uh, kind of the, the quick and the dirty about what to expect. Like, like the other school districts have said, we, we went through the same process with ICS about, do we have the space to even accomplish this? And so on this slide, I put, is this feasible? I really believe that this is a great exercise for schools to do as sort of a step one. Uh, MREA has some great tools from, from uh, Fred Nolan that he, you know, he covered briefly there. So I encourage districts to go look. But when we did this, you'll see that it's, uh, we were expecting that one staff member to nine students ratio. And it showed us very quickly that this is feasible and there is space. We may need to look at some learning spaces differently, uh, gyms, auditoriums, those kind of places, but we do have the square footage to accomplish this 50% capacity. Um, I, I'm not gonna be able to go through every little detail of our plan, but if you want more information, this is a, this is a screenshot of our website right there at the top, reopening school plan, feel free to click on that if you want more information or if you want some of the documents in Word format or whatever it might be, uh, get in touch with me and, I, and we're happy to share. All right, our elementary hybrid schedule. We are commonly a three section school. Uh, as, our, as our kids get older and hit upper elementary, it, it shifts to two sections, but our, our schedule here for the hybrid is gonna be based on three sections. So as we look at the long haul and the future of what uh, this COVID-19 pandemic will do to uh, just public education in general, it was important that we talked about how do we build the skills of our educators? How do we, how do we prepare not only for what's happening right now, but for the future? And so our, in our schedule, we are gonna have two of the three section teachers dedicated for the in-person work. So 50% of the kids will show up from any given grade and two of those teachers will divide 50% and we'll, we'll, we'll provide the face-to-face -face instruction. The third section will be dedicated to the distance learning staff and that's highlighted here in green. So our, our elementary principal had conversations with our staff members um, she approached them and said, you know, we think you'd be great at this. We, we, we'd like you to learn this and to really dive in and, and to become one of our resident experts on distance learning. And so all of these teachers have agreed to, to be those people. So, at, what, so what this looks like is when 50% of the kids come in, the in-person teachers will take them and obviously provide the instruction. But the distance learning teacher is going to be responsible for preparing all the packets that go home. Uh, contacting parents on a daily basis for the kids that are in distance learning and being that point of contact for any for everything that's happening outside of the school day. Um, and we're, and we're as a superintendent, I'm really excited about this because again, we're building these resident experts in our school system so that when the day comes where we do more of this, like on snow days, for example, these are going to be the people that we know have worked the bugs out. Uh, they can get up in front of our staff and present. They can support our staff members in the future. Um, so we're really excited about that model. On the secondary side of things, uh, this would be similar to, a, uh, uh, to the Mora schedule. 
but we intend on the on the hybrid schedule in the high school and again we're a seventh through 12 high school that we would bring the seventh eighth and ninth graders in on mondays and tuesdays and then the 10th 11th and 12th graders would come on thursdays and fridays Wednesdays would be dedicated to professional development, to office hours for staff, and for distance learning connections uh, for, the, for, the, for the various groups that need support. Wednesdays also provide us a day for a deep cleaning with our custodial staff so that we can, uh, you know, we can make sure that the building is ready for the next group when they come in. But I think it's important here to, to, to just show you that we're, a seven, we're normally a seven period day schedule but in this schedule, we're moving to an eight period day. So if you look at Monday for the seventh and eighth graders, they're gonna have periods one, two, three, and four on Monday in a block. And then on Tuesday, they're gonna have periods five, six, seven, and eight. So we get, again, we get all seven periods in, but we've added that eighth period. Eighth period is gonna be dedicated to an advisory time. So every high school teacher is going to have a group of students they're responsible with, meet, with meeting with in an, in an advisory setting. And I want to highlight this because our district really struggles with broadband access for our families. So in that advisory period, the goal is when the kids leave at the end of their second day of face-to-face -face instruction, that they have everything they need for distance learning the next three days. So that might mean downloading assignments onto their Chromebooks, that might mean running around and collecting packets if they need to from their other teachers. Hopefully we have that organized. It may be homework time if the kids are ready and, and, and they have all that information. They may need to uh, connect with families during that time just to make sure everybody has what they need for the distance learning times. And so that would be the same for the seventh, eighth and ninth grade and same for the 10th through 12th graders. Some other considerations. This is all listed in our plan on, on the link uh, on our website, but transportation considerations. We, we um, as a small school, we do not run tiered busing. So we think we're, we're able to run the same bus routes every single day of the week. But as this settles in, as the school year begins in a hybrid model, we're gonna have the Monday kids, the Tuesday kids, and the Thursday and Friday kids, and those schedules will take care of themselves. And we think that, that we'll get right down to a 50% capacity on any given day. Um, we intend to uh, have the kids sit every other seat, load the buses from back to front, try to have the kids sit over against the windows as much as possible to accommodate that distance. We've talked to our bus company about having several of the windows down on the bus as much as possible. That may be a little difficult in December and January and those kind of those winter months, but, uh, but they assure us that there's ways we can accommodate that. We also put a note on here that DOT will not allow seats to be removed or barriers to be installed on buses. And we think that's important because obviously we are, you know, our head jumps right to that. Maybe we should be thinking about barriers, but we're not allowed to do that. Uh, food service considerations, uh, just when it comes to transportation first, we intend on Wednesdays to deliver, to run the buses and to deliver uh, unitized meals to our families uh, for, for their distance learning days. So um, similar to what we did last spring, we actually ran the buses every single day last spring, but in this model, we would run them just on Wednesdays and deliver those meals as well. Some of our infrastructure considerations. Uh, we may get different guidance on this coming up, it sounds like from the governor, but at this time, our plan does not require masks of, of everybody. Of course, we would allow people to wear masks as they choose to. Uh, high risk individuals, of course, we would make sure we, pr we provide them with PPE that they need. If students come to us and they have a temperature or aren't feeling well, we would put masks on those kids and get them to the nurse's office while they wait to be picked up. But again, we would not be requiring masks of kids and staff unless we're directed to do so. Heating, venting, and air conditioning. Uh, we've worked with our custodial department to talk about is, are there settings or changes to make with our, HVAC, uh, with our HVAC system? We have a fairly new system. We are not gonna go change standards or schedules or things like that. 
uh, because that that can create other problems in your building. But but uh, as an example, we may not have our uh, some of our spaces go to unoccupied. You know, we try to do that to save money, to save to save energy. But in this case, we would we would circulate as much fresh air as possible. Physical changes, and I think Jeff touched on this. We would uh, dismantle our drinking fountains in this model because that's uh, that's going to be a safety concern. Uh, students would be allowed to bring bottles uh, uh, to run their our uh, touchless bottle fillers. In our re with our restrooms, our staff will stagger restroom breaks to accommodate just a few students at a time in there. And of course, signage and things would be put up around the building. We're working on that right now. Hand sanitizing and hand washing schedules would, would be in place for all students and staff, especially prior to meals or, or, uh, or uh, you, know, you know, those times when, uh, when, when they're gonna be in other places except for their classrooms. Building cleaning and sanitation procedures. We are considering and, and we'll probably have our evening custodians shift to daytime schedules in a hybrid model. Because what we think we can do is we can, we can create schedules for our custodians uh, to get into spaces that are not being utilized and, and sanitized. So passing times on teacher prep periods, um, you know, other times of the day when we can just try to get in there, wipe the door handles, wipe the desks down, and uh, uh, try to accommodate that sanitizing as much as possible. So what's next for us? Once, once the governor uh, releases his, uh, or, or gives us direction on which model we're gonna use, we intend to survey our families about the impact of our plan and that model, because we want, we want them to tell us where the struggles are gonna be. So maybe we can try to um, alleviate that for the families. Uh, professional development planning, our principals right now are putting plans in place to try to support our teachers with this. This is, a, and you've seen it in the news, this is a scary thing for our teachers. And so we need to make sure that we can be there supporting, try to connect them with people who are ahead potentially in, in their learning, uh, in their own professional development. So we're working on that. We're also working on written expectations for students and parents. Uh, if you're like us, we had a lot of questions and concerns about distance learning while, you know, while parents try to work their own job, but also provide instruction to their kids during distance learning. We, we wanna get down to try to alleviate some of that. What, do, what is really expected of a, of, of a parent and a student during distance learning days? And written expectations of our teachers. If we allow teachers to work from home during distance learning, uh, what does that mean? You know, what is expected of them? Um, are they supposed to be in contact at certain times? Do they have office hours? Uh, putting some of that in writing so that it's, it's clear and it's, it's easy for our teachers to understand. And then meet with our union leadership. Once that model is released, uh, we need to get those union leaders in here and examine those contractual issues to try to get ahead of it. And communicate, communicate, communicate. Um, our plan online is in Google format and those documents are updated in real time. So just about every day I tweak a little something or as we learn it, I, I go and I, I, I change our wording or I add, a, add some more information. And so we're asking our parents to check back regularly. We want that to be the one-stop shop where they can come back and, and really dive into how does this affect their family. And then of course, we need to be prepared to switch between the models throughout the, throughout the school year. Uh, I fully expect that we may end up using all three models as this school year goes on. And so are, three, are all three models ready and are they available? And do our, do our parents and families know uh, what to expect in all three models? Hey, thanks a lot, Andy. So uh, just the next steps for everybody who's on the uh, webinar today, we will be loading up all the uh, information along with the webinar and the recording on the website. I know we had a little bit of an issue today with uh, some of the districts that wanted to join could not. So we'll make sure that they have access to the actual recording and the PowerPoint. Going forward, uh, one of the things we have talked about is because I think it'll be an ongoing issue and changing and you need to be flexible. Uh, we're thinking potentially of doing a monthly update webinars um, and really having these three districts kind of talk about what challenges they re uh, with the reopening occurred, what's going well, what isn't. So I think what it does is it provides uh, all of you some access and a kind of a cohort group that you can discuss some of the challenges as you move forward. So that's our plan uh, as we move forward. I do wanna again, uh, I know we'll take some questions and answers here. 
But I do want to thank a lot of people. I think we had almost 30 people and professionals, a lot of them from legal. Um, again, uh, Neil Carlson from the USC of Minnesota is uh, Jeff Schultz keeps calling him a uh, mini Dr. Fauci on our team, uh, just so that we had a really a comprehensive holistic group looking at this issue and helping develop these frameworks. Um, you know, they, they put a lot of time into this. They dedicated a lot of their own personal time uh, pro bono. And I think everybody's kind of getting together to move this thing forward and really reopen schools uh, in, in the safest manner we can uh, to limit transmission. I think that there is absolutely uh, situations you will all run into where uh, people will be positive, uh, there will be concerns, but I think if you have a plan laid out, it's gonna be a lot easier to manage as we move forward. So with that, let me pass it on to Aaron to, uh, if you can go through some of the uh, Q&A, Aaron. Yeah, good morning, everyone. My name is Aaron Sorensen, and I'm the marketing director for ICS. I wanted to, once again, apologize for the technical difficulties we experienced this morning, but like Arif said, this webinar recording and any other supplemental documents will be uploaded to our website following this meeting. Uh, moving into FAQs, thank you all for your questions and conversation in the chat. I will do my best to pull out questions that weren't directly answered by a member of our team, but certainly feel free to add any additional FAQs in there as well. I'm going to ask this question to Brenda, or maybe to the rest of the group as well. Are schools asking staff to be on campus every day or just days they teach in person? Uh, I think we do not know the answer to that will be the answer um, that many of those um, kind of technical questions. Um, we'll have to meet with our committee and our committee is going to have to make some of these decisions together. Uh, we have uh, the union on that committee, um, our superintendent, um, the principals, everybody's represented. So those will be really good questions for that committee and we'll work through um, those types of answers. Uh, together. I'm happy to jump in on that too. In our schedule, I think the day that's that's in question with that is Wednesdays. Um, at this time, we intend to have everybody, all of our teachers on site, uh, especially as we get going. But I could see as we as we look at that deep cleaning on Wednesdays, where Wednesday may evolve into a uh, you know teach at home day. And the same with Bemidji, um, we're going to be working with our committees and, and determining that once we know what the plan is going to be. Thank you. Another question that I will propose to all districts, are your three districts doing daily health checks for staff and students? In Bemidji, we will be doing that and we're actually currently doing it during our summer program as well. In, in Bemidji this fall, we will be doing health checks uh, you know with questions every day and also with the taking of temperatures for students every single day and just as an example at Jean Dillon we've got three doors out of our 11 designated for entrance points for typical traffic and if one becomes um, for lack of a better word compromised because somebody maybe um, has a high temperature we could shut that one down and go to an alternate uh, entrance point fairly quickly but I think that's one of those things that you just have to be really mindful of and that's going to take some training for the staff because we have one uh, school nurse uh, full time and then one that's part time. And so we're going to have to train some of our other paraprofessionals likely on how to take those temperatures accurately at the door. Um, in Mora, it's interesting. We included that question of comfort on both the parent survey and the staff survey. And then what listed a bunch of things. What would make you feel more comfortable coming back to school? And we've had both a staff health checks and um, student health checks on there. And they weren't, there wasn't a high percentage that clicked on those. It was way more, and these were heavily about cleaning and sanitizing, about uh, following um, guidance on um, social distancing and protocols surrounding that. So it really wasn't a popular thing on our surveys, which was interesting to me. In East Central, our, our plan right now is to not have a formal, you know, temperature taking process, but uh, like in our elementary during morning meeting uh, with our elementary kids, our, our staff would have some set questions to ask the kids. 
Um, and as I'm sure everybody can relate, you know, in, in elementary schools, teachers are really good about seeing and, and, and hearing and, you know, looking for those things when kids are not feeling well. Any kid that we have concerns about would be, would, would have a mask put on them and be moved to the nurse's office right away for that health screen. Um, so that's our plan right now. Thank you. Another question to all districts. Part of MDH's guidance relates to offering mental health support for staff, students, and families. How are districts planning to do that? I could, I could talk a little bit. Brenda, you could probably sure. share some more too, but we have uh, part of our planning team will be our guidance counselors and supports. So I think we'll lean heavily on our guidance counselors to develop uh, those mental health and social emotional learning pieces. Um, along with maybe some connections with our county uh, services. Yeah, and we have two social workers at the elementary. We have a social worker at the high school and two guidance counselors. And they did a, just a tremendous job on our distance learning um, with their SEL lessons and supporting kids, supporting families. So yeah, we'll move forward with that because it was very good, very positive. Um, I was very impressed with what they did in the spring. So we'll move forward with that. And Bemidji is operating in, in much the same way, but we also do plan and hope to, uh, to really work closely with county and other organizations which can help our district in its efforts. We have counselors, social workers, mental health practitioners, but they, are, they were already very strapped even before the pandemic hit us. So we know that they're going to be really burdened with the work that they do. So we're going to need to work with all of the available agencies in our community and in our county to meet the needs of our students, which we expect are going to be quite high. And I, I, would like, I would like to add our social workers have created a website of tools for our teaching staff um, to calming tools, uh, high anxiety tools, resources that our classroom teachers can go to to utilize at any time um, based upon their needs. And at Gene Dillon, we have a care team that is made up of a social worker, a school psychologist, and a school counselor. And uh, they've been really proactive in putting together much of what Kalina's talked about. They're also available throughout the school day for uh, young people that might need them. And then we also, uh, in the first part of our day, right when the kiddos come in, we'll have our homeroom session, if you will. And we do practice the responsive classroom piece. And so morning meeting is a big part of that, much like Andy mentioned for, for his school as well. I would just add, uh, same for East Central, just one more piece is we have a pretty comprehensive mental health um, therapy team. In fact, we, we have a therapist that actually comes in and provides mental health therapy for our staff if they choose to, part, to participate. So that would, that would continue on Wednesdays, um, on those days when our staff is here. And uh, so we wanna make sure we continue to support our staff in that manner. And then our, our, our therapy, um, our therapists that support our kids would also have, still have access to their offices and be available on, on the in-person days here at school. Wonderful, thank you guys. Uh, another question that I will put out there, any ideas on how special education services will fit into the plan? I can jump in on that. I, that is a huge question, right, for everybody. Uh, right now, uh, we're very fortunate to be members of the St. Croix River Education District. Um, and right now they are making plans uh, for us. To, uh, th they're providing some language for us to be able to put into our all three scenarios about how each one of them impacts special education. They are also working on a plan right now to allow our special ed teachers to uh, draft uh, those changes to the IEP for each student as they relate to all three plans. So as we look to switch between models, each special education student would have those scenarios inserted into their IEPs. Uh, that's, a, that, that's a heavy lift and we're gonna have to dedicate some time to our special education teachers, but uh, we think that's a good direction to go. Yeah, we have, we have the same thing in Moral. We're part of a Rum River Special Ed Cooperative. And so our special ed uh, person in Mora, uh, that's our leader will be, getting guidance from the special ed cooperative. Um, but as Andy said, it's, uh, it was challenging during distance learning and it probably will be even more challenging trying to navigate between three different models. But hopefully we'll be able to have students on site, um, which, which should help. 
And I'll chime in that that's exactly the, for Bemidji, the same thing we're doing. We're working with our special ed director, district-wide director, and our various coordinators within the district. And we are incorporating into IEPs much of what we need to do. And uh, we definitely do hope that our students can be in buildings as much as possible. Thank you. This question came up during the Mora section, but I think applies to the rest of the districts. Will you have separate teachers in charge of teaching in person and separate teachers doing distance learning? Will that be for upper grades too? Uh, well, when we did our um, staff survey, um, one of our questions was, do you have any, any situation that might get in the way of you performing at school if we did a in-person or a hybrid model? Um, so we know that we have several staff that will have to do something else besides work with kids in the classroom, which is okay, because we have a lot of families that are going to choose the family flex option. Um, the teachers um, that I know about so far are spread out along grades and content, which is awesome. Um, they will become our distance learning cohort, most likely. And then the kids that are choosing to do that family flex option, um, I've gone through all, um, all of those families and the students, and they're almost equally dispersed amongst the grades as well. And so it's kind of working out, and it's a great thing to know, um, and really valuable information we got from our survey because there's a good match there. So um, that's probably how we will end up doing that. Thank you, Brenda. Another question that I have, if families are choosing distance learning, are you going to have them commit to distance learning for the entire year? I, I don't think so. I think our family flex option, um, I, I, think, I think, you know, because we're family friendly, we're going to service our families in the way that they need. So families' um, conditions change during the year, and we need to be nimble and actually change with our families. And so I'm open. And then we know families might say they want to distance learn, and they might start the year that way. And I've already talked to um, Dan about this. We need to be prepared for some of those families to quickly change their mind, because it's hard. It's really hard to educate your kids at home. And so um, we're prepared for some of those families to change their mind and, and we're good with that. And I think at Bemidji we would echo that as well. We wanna be safe and welcoming. And so as situations change, because they've changed a lot for us as we are going through the planning. So I imagine it's no different for families. So keeping in mind that we are here for them in whatever fashion that they need us is gonna be critical. I would echo the same thing in East Central, and I would just add that, you know, philosophically, we believe that some face-to-face -face time with their teacher in person is the best education model we can have. So I, I don't really believe uh, locking them into an entire year of distance learning is probably what's best for them, unless they choose to go that route. And because of what you've been hearing here from the districts between distance learning and in person, it's going to be really important that staff collaborate so you have the same pacing schedule, you have the same content covered because students not only will go back and forth voluntarily, but if you have a case in a classroom or a pod, you may have to self isolate those 14 students for two weeks and the teacher and they move to distance learning. So this is going to put a lot of emphasis on teacher collaboration and curriculum planning so students can seamlessly move between these models. And I'll just, I'll just say like going with what Fred just said. Our Wednesday, our PLCs are going to happen on Wednesday, and our PLCs will be more important than ever um, because of what you just said. And having those distance learn teachers be directly in the PLC um, with our general ed classroom teachers on the hybrid, that's, that'll have to happen. So um, PLCs has to happen, really important. And to add to that, in Bemidji, we're looking at a childcare model where they'll be in separate pods every day and they could be kids coming from several different sections within a building and we need to make sure that as our people work with those students that they are all on the same page, if you will, when it comes to what they're learning. Reef, would you like to wrap us up? 
Yeah, I'll uh, wrap everybody up. I think that um, just want to make sure that if there's additional questions, I know we do have a, a FAQ document on the website and Aaron will be sending out that web website link so you can access it and look at the information. Uh, in closing, just thank you so much for each of the district that was willing to put the time and effort, I think, going over and beyond here uh, to kind of work with us and put together these PowerPoints and the information so we can share uh, with a lot of other districts. I hope it was helpful. Uh, again, as I mentioned, we will be planning to do probably monthly uh, webinars just to see how each of these districts is going through the process and what additional challenges and solutions they have in place. Uh, we will be doing a survey, um, if I'm correct, Aaron, just to make sure uh, in the survey though, if you are interested in any other types of topics or seminars as it relates to COVID, whether it's food services or those kind of things, let us know because we're able to pull those expertise in as we did in transportation, as we did in facilities. Um, we could kind of pull the experts in there and have them kind of talk about this and give you additional information. Um, so here's some additional presentation resources that you can link. Uh, this will all be available. Um, and again, thank you for everyone for participating. I apologize for some of the ones who don't join. So hopefully this is recorded and they'll be able to get that information. Uh, with that, um, if there's no other questions, we'll close the webinar and uh, good luck everyone. It's gonna be a challenging year, but I think uh, if you plan correctly, I think things will go as well as they can with this situation. Thank you, take care.